Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining me for the 10th episode in the Conversation with Alan series. I'm Alan Locker. I created this series to have open and honest discussions about the rise of hate and the rise of anti-Semitism with high hopes that it leads to conversations that make us all think about our own place in history and what we can do together to change this country's course. Tonight, journalist Andrew Lapin is here to discuss his new podcast series, Radioactive, that explores the life and legacy of Father, Father Charles Coughlin, America's high priest of hate and a notorious anti-Semite. During the 1930s and 1940s, Coughlin became one of the first people to use radio as a platform to preach religion, politics, and worst of all, hate to an audience of some 30 million listeners weekly. Coughlin's growing fan base came with clout, and he soon had the ears of stars and celebrity, industry, and politics, including Babe Ruth, Henry Ford, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. How did one man manage to gain power and popularity while openly supporting Hitler and broadcasting anti-Semitism? Andrew has been working on Radioactive, a podcast about the life and legacy of this chaplain, since 2017. In the eight-part series, he weaves together interviews with prominent scholars, writers, and broadcasters, and rarely heard archival materials to tell the story of Father Coughlin's rise from a small and snow-covered parish up, to north, up north to America's first media star and his sharp and violent fall from grace. Lapin starts with his own experience growing up Jewish just minutes away from Coughlin's Shrine of the Little Flower. He explores his rise to fame as it parallels America's descent into the Great Depression. With more than 50 million Americans currently getting much of their news from talk radio and with on-air personalities cultivating a following and influencing politics, Radioactive tells the story of the genre's stormy birth and how an unscrupulous and bigoted con man used this new medium to get much too close to political power, a story as alarmingly relevant today as it was back in the 1930s. I'm really excited that Andrew is here today to talk about Radioactive. So please welcome to the locker room, journalist Andrew Lapin. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful thank introduction. You. <laughs> there was a lot to say. Um, really, thank you so much. Uh, you know, until um, our mutual friend Tanya had reached out to me, I had never heard about this gentleman and... I am fascinated um, by by this and, and by your podcast. But I'd love to, you know, go back. Uh, you grew up Jewish in Detroit. Tell me, you know, what was your childhood like growing up Jewish there? You know, my childhood was was pretty happy. Um, I always felt, you know, very very supported. Uh, the Metro Detroit Jewish community today uh, is 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 very robust and. Um, you know, we I, I went to synagogue and it, there were even enough Jews at my local public school where we got the high holidays off from school. Um, nice. And and so I yeah, I, I grew up in this environment that that felt very close knit. Right. And and very supportive, um, not only of, of Jews, but of sort of people from all, all different backgrounds. And I got to know all kinds of people in school. Um, and and that was that was like pretty special for me looking back on it, especially given that this was basically in the shadow of Father Coughlin's church. Uh, you know, I, I grew up only literally uh, two miles from the church. And uh, if anyone, you know, watching this is from the Detroit area, uh, you've probably seen this church because it's just, it's a landmark. Um, it, it sits on, on, a, on a very busy intersection. It's, it's about a hundred feet tall. Um, this very prominent, you know, limestone carving of Jesus. And, and so it's, it's, its presence is just felt um, wherever you go. And if you know the history behind it, that very presence becomes this sort of creepy factor, right? But it also becomes, I think, for Detroit's Jewish community, um, also a symbol of resilience that we've able to actually, you know, survive and thrive in this space that at one time had America's most famous anti-Semite uh, broadcasting from it. Which, which is just mind boggling. When do you recall when you first uh, learned about anti-Semitism? 
Well, I remember learning it. I think it, it would have had to have been through um, like, uh, uh, you know, Hebrew school that I attended as a kid, uh, lectures from, from my parents. I, I do have a very clear memory of, of, you know, my dad telling me about the Shrine of the Little Flower and the history behind it when I was, I don't even know if I was in high school yet. I think I, it was probably middle school around then. Um, and, and that was, that was really eye opening moment for me. I remember, I remember being sort of taken aback by it. Um, not, not even so much because, uh, of the, the fact that, that there was an anti-Semite, you know, 80 years ago as by the fact that, um, that people all across America sent this guy money, like that, that they liked what he was saying. You know, that was really, that was really the revelation for me is that, oh, he built this church with the money he earned from his radio show, which was an anti-Semitic radio show. Um, and, and so it wasn't so much just like one figure as it was this understanding that, oh, like the masses, you know, at one point or another um, support and believe in the kinds of things that, you know, this guy was saying. The size of his audience is just mind blowing, you know. Um, what, how did you end up in journalism? I always really enjoyed writing. My early idols were... Um, Dave Barry, the humor columnist, and Roger Ebert, the film critic, which is like uh -huh. yeah. very ner very nerdy um, idols to have uh, when you're when you're in high school. But but I always really liked writing. You know, I thought maybe I'd be a fiction writer. Um, I I sort of fell into journalism when I got to uh, to college. Although I had actually started doing some pieces while in high school for the Detroit News, um, which was really exciting. You know, at the time they had a a section for teenagers, which which doesn't really exist anymore. But they really wanted to encourage. Um, local teenagers to get interested in writing and in journalism. And so I took that opportunity at the time because I, I just really liked to write. Um, and then did the student paper at the University of Michigan, um, mostly because I wanted to be a film critic. But the paper takes itself so seriously that once you're once you're in that building, you have sort of no choice but to also get really invested in journalism and in like what's happening, you know, on campus and, and really and really covering the community uh, as strongly as you can. And so from there, I, I um, you know, sort of figured I would I would give it a shot. Um, and when I landed an internship immediately after college, it was with NPR. Um, and that, that sort of set oh, me off on a, on a good path to, to, to find my way to this career. That that's, I mean, that's a great start. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's definitely a great start. Um, tell everybody, uh, who you're writing for today. Yeah. So today I'm the managing editor for local news at the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, which is a wire service that covers the Jewish world. And it's pretty historic. It was founded in the 1910s, you know, so it's over 100 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, and JTA has covered a lot of the sort of most significant, you know, world events from a Jewish perspective. Um, in fact, when I was doing my research for the Father Coughlin podcast, I discovered like old articles, you know, written in JTA about Father Coughlin and like the contemporaneous reaction to him, which was which was really exciting. But um, but yeah, it, mostly in my role, I do a lot of um, coverage and soliciting of stories um, about local Jewish communities across the U.S. Um, we recently acquired the New York Jewish Week. And so I've been kind of focused on, you know, helping uh, helping that project get off the ground and making sure we're really doing a good job covering Jewish New York, but then also Jewish communities outside of New York, which which often get overlooked. Um, and and every Jewish community has a story to tell. And that's been one of the real rewards of my job is getting a chance to to to, to plumb those stories. Uh -huh. That's fantastic. Yeah, you know, you, you and I talked before backstage and I know you've covered um, anti-Semitism over the years. Is there one particular story that has had a large impact, you know, um, about anti-Semitism that you've covered? Right. I, I'm trying to think of things that I have covered specifically. Um, you know, I did, I can tell you this. So last year, I was the um, I was the editor in chief of the Detroit Jewish News, and uh, my staff and I discovered that the former head of America's largest neo-Nazi group, um, who claimed to have recently left Nazism and, and sort of left hate, um, lived in Detroit, and so I decided to interview him, um, and and I wanted to learn about what what sort of things he had done while he was in the movement, because he had been in the movement for, I think, around 25 years, like a, a very long time, most of that time as the head of, of this neo-Nazi group. Um, and then also sort of what, what caused him to leave. And it wound up very, being a very complex and, and, um, and compelling story. 
but not one that I, you know, I entered easily. You know, it, it felt really unnerving to 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 interview him um, and and sort of learn get his story, which does intersect in a way with the Charlottesville story of 2017 because he is um, he he was named as a defendant in the the, the ongoing lawsuit. Um, around around the aftermath of Charlottesville, which is now playing out in uh, playing in out court. in real yeah playing out in real time real time right and I, I I will mention that because I don't fully understand it but I heard a story that um, the trial is not open so people are not allowed in the courtroom but they are allowed to listen by telephone I don't know if you I, heard heard this. I believe so we have a yeah we have a, a, a one of our reporters at JTA is following the trial and uh and, and he'll be doing some reporting there are i think a, there's a couple of reporters sort of on site but and yeah i think you can you can listen in uh what i understand about the trial a lot of it so far has been mostly these defendants sort of spewing hateful things hey, from, from right. the stand um but, but we're, we're and to that's those. that's the story i heard was that people are calling in to listen and actually they're trying to recruit for neo-nazi organization which oh, is wow Hor horrible. You know, when you think about anti-Semitism today, you know, and, and being a journalist, so you probably are, you know, wit witness to a lot or, or, you know, see a lot. What, what frightens you most? That's a good question. I think what frightens me the most, certainly thinking about the work I did in this podcast, is the degree to which people um, either don't know the sort of worst aspects of our own history mm -hmm. or are actively working to rewrite history, um, which, it, which happens all over the world. It doesn't, it does not just happen in the U S although right now there is a large debate happening in the U S around how we teach history. Correct. Um, and, and, and not uh, what we're talking about, not a, well, yeah, some degree, you know, there are people who deny the Holocaust existed, but about critical race, all of that. Well, I, I think, right. It's not explicitly about, some of these things that we're talking about, but in a way it also is because, uh, you know, Henry Ford, as an example, Babe Ruth, um, you know, a lot of these figures who were famous at the time and who we, we remember as being these American icons uh, were also had, you know, anti-Semitic, either latent or like very explicit, uh, you know, anti-Semitic beliefs and, and hateful beliefs in, in many other ways, which is something that I get into in the podcast. And, and that's something that, you know, a lot of people would probably prefer not to remember or, or think about. Mm hmm. Well, let's, you know, let's dive in to Radioactive, uh, the Father Coughlin story. Can you take me back? Um, I know your father talked about the, the church. Is that when you first learned about him through your father? It was, yeah. I mean, I think people in my, my father and my grandparents' generation um, who, who grew up Jewish in the Detroit area uh, sort of knew the story, but in a way that you might know say an urban legend um you know i use i use the metaphor in the in the podcast of a haunted house and that and that's kind of what it felt like was just you know there, there were these ghosts of hate you know around but no one was sort of actively being hurt no one was actively preaching hate um at the time and so over time a lot of these memories kind of fade away or, or don't seem as as crucial or as important um but uh but that had always kind of stuck with me and i remember sort of in my head linking the Father Coughlin story, you know, when I was in high school, there were a lot of these debates around like the war on Christmas and on this idea of like America as a Christian nation and hearing phrases like Judeo-Christian values and thinking about what they actually mean. Um, and and it sort of was percolating for me at the time, but it, it didn't really sort of make itself feel like an urgent, relevant story until, you know, a, a, a few years ago, 2016, 2017, when I started hearing the word demagogue a lot in US media. And I also heard the word unprecedented a lot in US media as though, uh, as in, you know, everything that is happening right now uh, has never happened before in American history. Gotcha. <laughs> I was gonna you ask, know? I wasn't sure what you meant by, the, oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Right, because it, right. Because, you know, this is the 1930s, you know, it's not unprecedented. Exactly, um, what, not what unprecedented. Seeing, yeah, what we're seeing today. So, and, and Jewish Detroiters, I think called his church, the Shrine of the Little Fascist. Did you ever hear it referred to that way? Uh, only in in sort of remembering, you know, what what Jewish stories would say. I also heard um, uh, Shrine of the Little Fuhrer, uh, and uh, you know, I would I would I would sort of see it wasn't something that was talked about a lot, right? Especially not among people of my generation. 
um, which was which was another part of the reason why I was interested in the story. It's not like it's as simple as all Jews remember who Father Coughlin was and ever, no one else remembers. It, it, it's really like very few people remember who he was, um, Jewish, Catholic, uh, and and beyond. I, I mean, when I when I visited the Archdiocese of Detroit to do my research in their archives, uh, you know, I would I would tell the employees kind of what I was working on, and and some of the younger employees, you know, my age, uh, would not would not know who he was. Uh, so so all those things sort of uh, gave me more of a uh, of a motivation to complete the the project. In, incredible. Um... You said, so my question was going to be, what prompted you to tell this story? So was it the, the fact that people were talking about the unprecedented things that were happening in 2016, 17, and you were like, oh, no, this isn't, un you know, is that the? I think that was a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm looking back on it now and thinking about what my original inspirations were. Um, a lot of it was trying to find this way to uh, to collide the past and the present and sort of show people the cyclical nature of history, which is something you hear historians talk about a lot. Um, and I also just felt like there was this myth growing that, you know, America has sort of always been on the right side of history. And like we were we were ready to, you know, stand up to the Nazis and all this stuff. And the real the real truth is much more complicated and I think really worth worth examining, especially in this era where we're sort of constantly talking about, you know, American exceptionalism and um, just this idea that we are sort of inherently like, you know, more, more free and, and better than, than everyone else. And, and I, I that, that sort of thing I think is important to, to puncture in, in a healthy way, uh, not, not in like a scolding way, but, but just in a way that, that helps people understand that it's not always been a safe place for right. for and, many, and many different people. We, you know, we learn from history, you know, we can mm -hmm. educate ourselves. Um, you set out, you know, you, you loved writing, you, you know, were thinking of being a movie critic. Um, was history something you were also fascinated with? I think history, I've, I have been interested in it, but, it, but this is definitely the most explicit kind of historical project I've, I've undertaken. Um, I mean, I did notice that my favorite kinds of movies to review when I, when I would review films for NPR or The Economist or other outlets were the ones that, allow, that took place in the past and that allowed me to sort of go on my own research journey into history, right? And I think in, in this case, especially, certainly there was a lot of my interest kind of baked into it, um, uh, particularly... Uh, that this is a, a media history story. And I've, I've been reporting on the media for, for mm -hmm. several years as well. Um, and from a creative standpoint, it was also just fascinating to me to think about making a podcast um, because I was really interested in the form mm -hmm. and especially in taking like an early radio star and presenting him to people in the way that they would have listened to him back, back, in, back yeah. in the day. And it's a much well, more intimate way to do it. And this is in your backyard. Exactly, all of those <laughs> things together. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you know, just to say it out loud for everybody, Father Coughlin preached over 18 decades ago. How how did you begin the daunting task of researching, you know, this man in this project? Yeah. Uh, so this was right. The tw <laughs> the 20s and 30s. Uh, yeah. Eight or eight or nine decades ago. Um, I began with, you know, a, a, a certain oh, amount of research. Sorry, I said 18. Yeah, no, yes, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just so we're clear. Yes, uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was definitely a daunting task, but, uh, you know, some of the legwork had already been done for me. Um, there, are, there are a couple um, books, historical, bio, you know, academic biographies of Coughlin that are out there that I, that I drew on. There were a lot of files um, locally um, in places, as I mentioned, the Archdiocese. Um, the University of Detroit Mercy, a local Catholic school, um, has, has digitized a good number of his collections. And really the first thing I did when I thought about trying to do some sort of project on Father Coughlin was to see if any of his radio shows had survived. Um, and they had. And that's when I knew it could work as a podcast because uh, anyone can listen to them. They're out there. And if you provide the right context on them, you can show people something they would have never seen before, right? It's like, you can read a book on him, but then you don't actually hear what he sounded like. And you don't hear the arguments he was making. And and you don't hear the music, the church music that was playing in the background while, while, while he talked and and, and built his, his arguments. Um, you don't hear the the rallies that he gave where he really sort of lets loose and, and gets sort of totally unhinged. Um, all of those things together um, were a great 
vehicle for me to like pursue my research. So a lot of it when you're doing a podcast is um, finding how much usable audio clips there are mm -hmm. out there. Um, and then you, you sort of build the, the narrative around what you can actually show the audience. Um, and then also it was just a lot of digging in, in university libraries and, you know, looking at his old FBI files and his old letters and, um, you know, his old magazines that he would publish and all, all that kind of stuff. There's like just a whole bunch of Coghlan memorabilia out there, which is one of the advantages to researching an egomaniac. You know, he wanted to put his yeah. name on everything. <laughs> and, and and almost scary that it still exists in some some respects. But his voice was quite um, intimidating, uh, uh, you know, listening to your podcast. I mean, he, you know, sounds unhinged at times. Yeah, he, he, he really does. He has he had this. Uh, I mean, I, it really was a gift. You know, I call it an amazing gift sort of in jest. But but he really knew how to draw you in and like hold your attention. And he could be talking about really nothing, just kind of like spinning these wild tales, you know, long run on sentences, um, random biblical references. Uh, he would just go on and on and on. And, and if you read the transcript, you're like, what is this guy talking about? But when you listen to him, you're really engaged. Like he's really, he really knows how to bring you along with his, with the power of his voice. I mean, that's the scary thing of people who are, who are um, using these mediums and use it in a way that really draws people to believe, you know, I mean, that's the comparison to today. I mean, we look at everybody who believes, you know, you know, that JFK Jr. is going to show up in Dallas or, you know, I mean, right. it's, you know, but they're, they're buying it, yeah. you know, yeah. hook, line and sinker. Was there, you know, when you start out and you start listening um, to these and, and reading uh, about him, was there one particular, I mean, I know all of it, but was there something um, that surprised you the most about him and the rhetoric he was spreading? I think what surprised me the most was when I really started to understand how far he went and sort of his his most insane period is like 1938, 39, when he's sort of right on this edge of like um, he's lost mainstream acceptance by that point. Um, but he knows he still has this like very dedicated group of really like radical followers who are who are still tuning into him and like would be willing to follow him to the ends of the earth and it's at that point when he uh decides he's going to put together this group called the christian front which is basically like a pro-nazi uh you know gang of like militias mm -hmm. who are who are planning to like take over the government and, and and so the more i read about and understood about the Christian front and, and his kind of Coughlin's symbiotic relationship to them as like the guy on the radio, giving them instructions. Um, the, the more just sort of unnerving that experience became and especially covering, you know, the January 6th, uh, events. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the minute you said, take, take over the government. I mean, that's where my mind went. The parallels are, are hard to miss. Yeah. I mean, it's, that was, uh, so disturbing. His rise um, coincided with one of the lowest points in history, the Great Depression. How how did the Great Depression help his message spread? Yeah. So the Great Depression kicks in in 1929, which is about three years after he started broadcasting. And this is really the moment when he sort of realizes um, how much power he can really have over his listeners, uh, because people, you know, largely sort of blue collar, middle class uh, are, are out of work by the millions. They have almost nothing, but many of them still have radios or they live in neighborhoods where like someone has a radio and the window is open. And so everyone can hear it. And it's, it's in that, it's in that process that Coughlin really finds a way to become like the voice of the people, which is a necessary thing for any demagogue to attain power. You know, he's able to say like the elites, like the bankers, you know, who caused this depression, aren't looking out for you and me and the government's not looking out for you and me. And nobody's, nobody's telling you honestly what's going on, but I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to be your voice. And this is the moment when people really start to love him. He start. this is when he starts dabbling in politics. Um, this is when, at, you know, uh, he takes an active uh, stance, which is, which is sort of crazy for like an ordained Catholic priest to be doing this, but he actually filmed a campaign ad 
in support of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and he did that because he felt that would be his best pathway to power. Like that's how much sway he had over the country in just a couple of short years. Uh, but from 1929 to you know 1932, um, this was the this was how swiftly he became America's voice and like someone who the highest levels of government had to respect. It, it's so crazy because we talk about how things can spread so fast today in social media, and you think that this man was able to, you know, uh, amass that in that you know you know millions of followers and and you mentioned this he blamed the banks on the great depression is that correct he did this thing that you see a lot of conspiracy theorists doing where he blamed both the banks and the communists for the great depression um which doesn't make a lot of sense uh because you would think that the hyper capitalists and the hyper communists would be opposed to each other but but in Coughlin's view and in the view of a lot of conspiracy theorists at the time like they were sort of working in harmony with each other and they were both being controlled by the jews um that was that was sort of the message that was being um propagated wow and, yeah. and i mentioned to you like i i was very unaware of Coughlin. And, you know, I absolutely knew who Henry Ford was, but I was not aware that Henry Ford was an anti-Semite as well. Um, can you talk about how, um, you know, hit, uh, Henry Ford's relationship to Jews and Coughlin's worship of him? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ford is like a really necessary precursor to like understand Coughlin's power. You know, Henry Ford basically made the city of Detroit, right? Um, he like was this captain <laughs> of industry who employed uh, so many people and and you know gave a lot of people like, like good paying jobs for the time so he was held in, in really high regard um he was also this really like budding fascist and uh and someone who did not tr just fundamentally did not trust jews did not trust foreigners didn't trust anyone who he sort of saw as like a potential usurper to his empire. Um, and he, he actually felt Hitler had good ideas. Like he, you know, he, I think met Hitler at one point um, and really admired him. And so Ford decides that in addition to his wealth uh, and power that he's attained through his, uh, his motor vehicle company, he's also going to become a, like a media mogul. Um, which is like a common step for like rich, rich men to do. Right. <laughs> um, and so in the early 20s, he launches his own newspaper. Uh, he really buys like a struggling newspaper called the Dearborn Independent. Dearborn is the suburb of Detroit where Henry Ford, um, you know, operated out of. And, and he, he buys this newspaper and he turns it into like his newspaper, the head, like the head, you know, it's still called the Dearborn Independent, but it's like very much his viewpoint. And he uses the Dearborn Independent to attack Jews. He, he reprints um, the, this famous anti-Semitic document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, he's writing all kinds of like horrible things about the international Jew, you know, sort of controlling the world. And, and he's pushing out his newspaper through his car dealership. So he sort of has the means to manipulate the market to try to get his newspaper and his toxic ideas in front of as many people as he can. Um, and, and Coughlin is sort of seeing all of this. Coughlin... Uh, was born in, in Canada and went to seminary in Canada and didn't come to Detroit until 1926. By that point, Henry Ford's newspaper had like totally flopped. He lost all this money on it. He was being sued for libel uh, by a Jewish union organizer. And so he, he, he folded his newspaper, but Coughlin sort of picks up the mantle there in Detroit media and sort of learns how to do mass media the right way, you know? Um, and, and Coughlin becomes powerful enough and gets in line enough with a lot of the other sort of big Detroit movers and shakers of the time that several years later, he and Ford are sort of counting themselves as, as allies. Um, and, and so they they did very much travel in, in the same circles. Wow. I mean, it, it, it's so fascinating to me and Coughlin realized or believed that he needed to become a celebrity in his own right. And he um, used Babe Ruth and the, uh, KKK, right? To do so? Yeah, in very different ways. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's absolutely true. So the so he sort of is brought in um, to this at what was at the time, like a very struggling, very new Catholic parish, right? And he is kind of tasked with not only growing the church, but like growing like the Catholic presence in Detroit. Um, and so he he does this by sort of coming up with this origin myth 
um, which no one, including myself, has been able to verify actually happened. But the story that Coughlin told everyone from the very early days of the Shrine of the Little Flower is that when the Detroit chapter of the Ku Klux Klan found out that there was going to be a new Catholic parish opening up in the area, they got so enraged because they hated Catholics that they went and they burned a cross on the front lawn of where the Shrine of the Little Flower was to be built. And Coughlin tells the story over and over because it allows him to play the victim and to be the persecuted minority and to be the one standing there saying, I will, I will fight this hate. Right. And so that is, that is one of the foundational stories that Coughlin used to justify launching his radio show. Um, and, and so that was, that was like sort of celebrity through, you know, through, I guess, self mythologizing. And then there was like the actual celebrity of Babe Ruth who um, helped run a fundraiser for the shrine when he and the New York Yankees came to town to play the Detroit Tigers. Uh, Coughlin had a friend who was a scout for the Tigers and through his friend, he got Babe Ruth to actually visit the church and compel people to donate money to help build the church. And, uh, and so people came from, from far and wide and it was a really kind of shrewd calculated move. Uh, and Coughlin was, was very, very good at, at that, those sorts of moves. And, and you mentioned, so the thing that could not be verified is if they really burned the cross on the front of the... Exactly. Yes, I should have clarified that. Right. No, no, no. But... I, that's what I thought you said. And I just want to, because it, it, it sort of, you know, I think of, you know, the election fraud stories that, you know, th th there's no proof to these things that continue to be spread. Yeah, and I want I want to be careful. Right. I want to be careful with the parallels here because... I think as far as the clan story goes, it was plausible because there was a large clan presence clan, at the time. Yeah. Okay. But the lack but, of any sort of reporting proof. on it. Right. Yeah. There's not a lot of proof for it as opposed yeah. to, I think something like, like a lot of the election fraud myths are sort of based on just complete nonsense. Right. Um, so right, right. I understand. What yeah. Yes. C c completely. But it, you know, it's just interesting. The sort of parallels in, continuing to you know if you say it enough people believe it absolutely absolutely <laughs> and and there's no better proof of that than you know just a f just like a decade ago um like a new catholic fraternal order like dedicated a plaque uh you know commemorating the time when father Coughlin supposedly fought off the ku klux klan right like that like like the story was powerful enough that at least a certain group of people were willing to like uh, memorialize honor it. Him. Yeah, yeah. As, right. And as a way to as a way to honor him. Wow. You know, I know, and you've said some of them, but there are so many factors that, uh, you know, you can attribute to his rise. Well, you know, in your eyes, what do you think um, some of the most prominent factors are? The so I think his rise is contributed <coughs> to yeah, a lot of a lot of factors, some of which we have already kind of touched upon. The Great Depression mm -hmm. was a huge factor in, in Coughlin's rise because when people had nothing, they had his voice. Um, the fact that he entered right at the beginning of radio as this incredibly powerful tool for mass communication, it was also super important to his rise. Um, radio was, was essentially like completely unregulated by the federal government. And so a figure like Coughlin could really just go off on his own. And he struck all these independent syndication deals to bring him, bring his show nationwide. And he did something no one had ever done before, which was like broadcast his sermon, like a, like a, you know, religious content over the radio. And so all of these things were, were, you know, he was a novelty um, because he was a Catholic priest, um, you know, who was also a celebrity. Um, and he, but he could also be this sort of man of the cloth and like this holy presence for people who, who were looking for that. Um, and then, you know, he really kind of tapped into this anger in the main, in the, uh, in the American body politic, um, when, you know, at this time when like FDR could be portrayed, uh, by, by some corners as like an out of touch elite, right. Then you had someone like father Coughlin able to, uh, to, to stand up against that. Um, he also benefited from frankly, like, a a, a permissible Catholic church, like the people who who supposed who were supposed to have been able to stop him according to the hierarchy of the Catholic Church uh, didn't really take any action or in some cases actively encouraged him to to keep building his his public profile um, and and he caught a lot of the higher ups at the Vatican by surprise because they were not used to a Catholic priest speaking to an audience beyond his immediate parish 
Um, and so all of those all of those things together, you know, it's like the sort of lack of checks and balances and then the, the confluence of like the right historical events at the right time and also just like really shrewd marketing and business savvy. All of those things together sort of brought him uh, fame and fortune. Brought him enormous power. Just the way your, your description of him in the cloth made him scary to me. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, CBS started carrying his program, but then eventually canceled him for being too controversial. Mm -hmm. um, but I think by that time, um, he didn't need them, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and this is one of the things we see <clears throat> several times during Coghlan's kind of peak years in the 1930s is that even when he oversteps his his boundaries um, and and does something that is like too out there for uh, like an institution such as CBS, uh, he has other means. He is he is you know becoming kind of too too powerful to touch in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, when when CBS decides they they drop him, he already has enough of an audience that he can make as I said these independent syndication deals with the, the radio stations directly, uh, which which prop, which allows him to profit a lot more um, and also allows him to really like bypass the big media conglomerates. Um, Coughlin really was funded by small dollar donations from like everyday Americans. He was not corporate backed, which is another important thing to understand about him. He wasn't he wasn't being propped up uh, by like, uh, you know, some someone in power right. who wanted to get a message across. He was his own man in that sense. This was his own power. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, FDR em embraced radio, but he distanced himself from Coughlin. Um, but Coughlin became obsessed with the Secretary of the Treasury at that time, right? <laughs> yes. Right. Henry Morgenthau <laughs> Jr., who uh, coincidentally was Jewish. Right. Uh, that he that this is the guy that Coughlin um, sort of goes after. Coughlin does a lot of um, financial uh, commentary, like a, like a, a lot of what he talks about when he enters the enters the political realm is um, is money issues and Treasury and banking and the gold standard versus the silver standard. And, uh, you know, all, all these kinds of things and how wars are going to impact the economy. Um, that was an obsession he had sort of uh, really until the end of his life, but like very much at that time, because with the Great Depression, like mm -hmm. money issues were really top of mind for a lot of people. And it was like very easy to paint the secretary of the Treasury, um, especially if he was Jewish and especially if he worked for a president who, you know, who didn't like Coughlin. It was very easy to paint him as this sort of nefarious figure who who might have secretly been trying to, um, you know, bring down America's banks again. Um, so it was it, Morgenthau was like a, a very convenient punching bag for Coughlin. And, you know, and up, up, he, neither he nor FDR particularly wanted to dignify Father Coughlin's uh, rantings with a response. They didn't want to legitimize him, uh, which had the effect of leaving him unchecked as he continued to say whatever he wanted. For years. For years. For years. Absolutely. He created the National Union for Social Justice and uh, as part of that social justice magazine. Can you elaborate on those? Yeah, this is one of the most the fascinating parts of the Father Coughlin story to me is like realizing just how involved he got in national politics. Um, he is so fed up by the time FDR is running for re-election in 1936. Coughlin is, is basically mad that he doesn't have more power, that he wasn't you know, asked to be a cabinet secretary himself. Um, and he, he, he translates that sort of anger and bitterness into a populist political movement um, where he actually does form, again, as a Catholic priest, I have to keep saying that because it's so right. bizarre. As right. a Catholic priest, he formed a third party, like a, like a political third party just to take on FDR and the Democrats. Um, and they, he fielded an actual count candidate who was a sitting member of Congress at the time. And he partnered with all of these other um, radical populists at the time who the media referred to as the lunatic fringe. Um, and, and together they thought they were going to build this movement and maybe they weren't going to win the white house, but they were going to try to play spoiler and sort of make their presence known. And, and then he went out and campaigned, he held rallies. He like encouraged people through his radio show to donate, uh, to the party. Um, and he has this sort of stroke of marketing genius by naming his party, uh, social justice, 
um, and sort of manipulating that phrase so that it means basically like social justice for like Christian Americans, like the people who we thought were deserving of, of social justice. Um, and it, so it's in this context that he also launches his magazine, Social Justice Magazine, which is like a, a periodical that is, a, again, has a national audience and is sort of Coughlin's vision. And the Social Justice Magazine is, is, is even more radical somehow than his radio show. And his correspondents are writing about how Nazi Germany is really successful at putting down all these communists and they are eventually reprinting um, again the protocols of the elders of zion and just and just sort of rank open anti-semitism um and and so it's 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 pretty remarkable that he built up this movement and and with with the with the national union for social justice specifically he was piggybacking off of the populist efforts of of uh, arguably a much more successful populist politician Huey Long, who actually, you know, did become governor of, and senator from Louisiana um, on the banks of a of a very populist minded uh, campaign. And if Huey Long had not been assassinated right before the 1936 presidential election, uh, we'd be, we'd be, we might be having a very different conversation, you know. Um, mm, so yeah. so that was like the movement. That was the space that Coughlin was playing in. It was very much grabbing enough of the, the fringes of American politics at the time to attempt to build some kind of cohesive uh, uh, movement and take a stand against the elites. But I loved this in your podcast because Father Coughlin really thought his candidate was going to win, right? <laughs> it's hard to know what he thought. He I mean, of, it's, I mean, he, uh, sure. He was like <laughs> ego driven enough where maybe he thought he could win, but I think more likely he just wanted to say something. Um, you know, he, he's not even saying towards the end of the campaign, He's he's saying like, oh, we're not going to win, but we'll get at least nine million votes, you know, which he knew was not enough to win the election. But he wanted some electoral votes. Um, he had. In, uh, <laughs> right. But that's in your podcast. He thought he was going to get nine million votes and he yeah. didn't even get one. <laughs> no, he didn't. We didn't did not even crack the one million voter. Mark. Yeah. I mean, that that's, you know, he, he was definitely you know, as he was throughout his life, way off base, <laughs> way, way off base over his head <laughs> yeah. and all, all, all of that sort of not all of able, the above could not read the room, you know, didn't know when his presence was not wanted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. And most people would say, well, that his story should just end there. Right. Cause he, he tried, he tried to like ingratiate himself um, into the mainstream and it failed. And so he's not a threat anymore. Uh, and so one of the points I try to make in the show is that, after this stunning defeat is really when he becomes more dangerous because he emboldens the, you know, the, the, the radicals who were still listening to him to go out and commit acts of violence and destruction. Yeah. And crazy. And, and he did become more emboldened too, because wasn't it um, father Bishop who was one of his supporters had died around that time as well. Isn't that, uh, yeah, his his bishop, Bishop Michael Gallagher, who ran the art, the Archdiocese of Detroit, um, was the guy who had been basically protecting him from anyone at the Vatican who might have wanted him to shut up. Um, and it's sort of hard to know, you know, what Gallagher's motives were here, but I'm sure he liked the attention that was being brought to the diocese. And uh, and, and so he yeah, Gallagher dies in 1937, sort of right after this like failed presidential campaign. And it's from there when Coughlin is, is sort of fighting a war on like multiple fronts because Gallagher's replacement um, as Bishop of Detroit does not like Coughlin and does not get along with him. And so then there's just a lot of like tit for tat of the two of them going back and forth. And, uh, you know, with the Bishop trying to mold Coughlin into like some semblance of like a respectable priest and Coughlin saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do my own thing. It was too late at that point. Too late. <laughs> Definitely too late. Is, is it um, father Gallagher or Bishop Gallagher? Um, why he was allowed to be so public in his hatred and calls for violence or. Yeah. Well, Gallagher was how Coughlin was allowed to basically build up his radio show to what it became. But his his hatred and calls for violence, he started doing that sort of on the campaign trail in like 36. Right. That's when he gets sort of his his most sort of intense voice. And Gallagher is asked, will you do something about Father Coughlin? He says, no, I won't. Um, and then and then after Gallagher dies, Coughlin really ramps up from there. Um, so definitely there was at least tacit you know, approval or support from his direct superior. 
crazy. It, it, it's crazy. Um, uh, Coglin admired Mussolini, yes. and he would write letters to him. Which fan mail is yep. another fan mail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Father Coglin is writing fan mail to Mussolini. Can you talk about some of the letters you read? Yeah, it's it's wild. Um, oh, you know, I was going to ask you as well. Yeah. Were you able to see um, any of the social justice magazines? Did they exist in your research? Absolutely. Those are all out there. Um, as I mentioned, the universities in Detroit who have done uh, like Coughlin archival projects have all have digitized. I think you can find pretty much every issue of social justice wow. magazine out there. So you can you can see what he was publishing and sort of how it was reflecting his his worldview. Um, and it's kind of wild. One of the more the more infamous, one of the contributors to Social Justice Magazine, Philip Johnson, later became like this world renowned architect. Um, and he had this completely other different second life that had nothing to do with his Nazism. Um, and, and so, you know, yeah, social justice had a huge you know, impact on the on the country. Um, so, yeah, I was able to, to peruse that. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the other question. And you read, you also read Mussol the letters to Mussolini. The Mussolini, the, yeah. yes, letters sorry. to Mussolini. I, I, yeah. I wanted to know about Social Justice Magazine if they were still in existence. So Yeah, 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 you. absolutely. Well, but they're not the still letters. in existence. Uh, no, right. no, no, so, I, yeah, but you yeah. can find the yeah, yes, yes. copies, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the letter, so that letter to Mussolini that I read in the podcast, it's an interesting story. It comes out of a, a, a file of correspondence that Coughlin had with um, his superior, the guy who replaced Bishop Gallagher, Ed Mooney, um, and all those files are are are, are archived. And um, in that file, Mooney is sort of gathering all of the, the this evidence and these details that p other people, other priests, and whoever are telling him about. Can you believe this crazy thing that Father Coughlin did? And one of them is like, "Look at this letter that he sent to Mussolini." And and it is it really is like a like just kind of open fan mail. I think the FBI had a copy of it as well. And it's, he's sort of, Coughlin is basically telling him, uh, your excellency, like the American media has been giving you a bad rap and I want to give you a chance through my platform, Social Justice Magazine, to allow you to clarify your thoughts for your for our readers, because I think they would be really interested in hearing what you have to say about the Jews. Um, and, you know, Coughlin is doing this. He, uh, to my knowledge, his letters sort of never are answered. Mussolini is like advised by his own ambassador not to have anything to do with Father Coughlin. But like Coughlin was certainly an admirer of fascism and Mussolini's brand of fascism was one that was permissible uh, of the, the Catholic church. Right. And, and Franco's as well. Coughlin mentions, mentions Franco a lot um, in his speeches in a very admiring way. And, you know, Coughlin at one point kind of says, you know, if this is to be, a showdown between fascism and communism, sort of just referring to like the global, you know, uh, uh, conflicts at the time. Uh, then I choose the side of fascism. He, he says this, you know, he hates communism so much and he hates, you know, what he believes are, you know, the Jewish control of communism so much that he is willing to op openly embrace fascism and dictators and authoritarians to uh to stop communism so that's that's sort of where he's coming from in all of this crazy yeah and, and there's an infamous uh rally at madison square garden that i you know loved hearing about in your podcast that just i don't know surprised me that it was you know at madison square garden what what can you tell us about that yeah absolutely this was in 1939 and it was an organization called the German American Bund, which was a, an American Nazi sympathizer group made up, I think, of a lot of German Americans, but also just a lot of Americans who really liked the Nazis and, and you know, wanted wanted Hitler to succeed. Um, and and people again, like sort of circling back to what we were talking about earlier, like we tend to forget that there were a lot of Nazi sympathizers in America. Um, you know, in the years before we decided we were going to enter the war, um, when it was still sort of a, a a political debate, right? A lot of people thought that Hitler had the right idea and there were enough of them to fill Madison Square Garden, um, you know, at the height of, at the height of its pop, uh, at the, of this movement's popularity. And it was like several groups, including the Christian Front, the group that was heavily inspired by Father Coughlin um, and a lot of these other sort of fringe uh, American groups. And there's a really excellent, very short documentary, only about seven minutes long um, that I would recommend 
that people check out if they want to learn more about this rally. It's called A Night at the Garden. And it was nominated for an Oscar a couple of years ago. And it's made up oh, almost wow. entirely of video archival footage from this from this event, which is just horrifying. To a night watch. at the garden? A night at the garden, yeah. So it's all out there, right? The entire video of that night survives. Um, it was interrupted at one point by a Jewish protester who went up on stage and, and was beaten and dragged off. Um, and, and yeah, it's really horrifying. And Father Coughlin is, is not there, but he is name dropped by one of the most prominent speakers at the rally. And you hear the crowd sort of cheering his name. Wow. Yeah. And he and he made a speech in November of 1938, where I think this speech in particular put him on the, the map as a full blown anti-Semite. Right. Absolutely. His most infamous radio address um, was aired in November of 1938, the week after uh, Kristallnacht, which was the, the night of broken glass in um, in Nazi Germany, Austria, um, Nazi occupied Czechoslovakia, um, this evening where violent mobs encouraged by Nazi officials take to the streets and destroy Jewish owned businesses, um, Jewish homes and, and synagogues and all of that. And, uh, you know, when this news reaches America, mo most of the American press is horrified by it. Coughlin instead suggests on his radio show that maybe the Jews deserved it. Um, and he is just sort of just sort of asking questions. Right. And he's saying, like, well, there's been all this persecution lately of both Jews and Christians. And, you know, maybe the Jews being persecuted um, has something to do with with what, you know, Jewish communists have done to Christians uh, in other countries. And so it's just it's like very much sort of in this conspiratorial mindset and very and very, very anti-Semitic. Um, and so that is really the moment when a lot of radio stations want to drop him. He loses a lot of um, his kind of more mainstream supporters. And it's really the first moment when like mainstream American Jewish groups are finally comfortable enough to say the thing they had always been thinking, which is that Father Coughlin is an anti-Semite and should not have a national platform. And should not be preaching. Yeah. Exactly. He, he um, so the FBI was created around this time. And he was under investigation. How did that all, you know, was it all these speeches? What were they investigating at that time? Yeah, they were investigating primarily this, this movement that he had kind of started, right? The social justice movement and the Christian front um, and, and his newspaper, which they sort of viewed as an agent of Axis propaganda, right? Um, in the early years of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover is really concerned with hunting down um, seditionists. <laughs> Which, you know, if you know anything about J. Edgar Hoover, he had very broad ideas of who was considered an enemy of America. He was he was certainly no no hero um, in that regard. But really, one of his first major targets is Father Coughlin. And so the FBI is trying to build this case against him as someone who um, is, is anti-American, someone who might be secretly plotting to overthrow the government. And the way they build this case is by examining the newspaper he's putting out, his radio show and the people, um, the members of the Christian Front who are going out and essentially committing acts of violence in his name. Um, and so that all builds up to like a trial of, you know, a certain group of about 17 members of the Christian Front. Um, and there, it, but there are these secret deals at the same time because the Catholic Church doesn't want to get embarrassed. You know, they, they, they come up with these deals to keep Father Coughlin out of, uh, of the trial. And they're not really able to, um, prosecute Coughlin himself just for having a radio show, right? That would be a violation of his First Amendment rights. So, so you know, free speech debates come up a lot as well when you look at when you look at Father Coughlin's story um, and and how you set limits on that and what what kind of limits can you set on broadcasting? All of these things are still being figured out as Father Coughlin is sort of openly taking advantage of the fact that no one has figured it out yet. Um, and the FBI never successfully prosecutes Coughlin even though they, they very much want to, and they spend a lot of time, you know, subpoenaing um, members of his inner circle and trying to get information on who he talked to and when, and, and did he ever have any contacts with Nazis and all that sort of thing. Uh, very much a lot of, you know, espionage going on. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, your research, Andrew, bravo. You know, a lot of what, for the viewers watching, a lot of what we've spoken about it, you know, because I've listened to episodes one through seven. So your research is incredible. Um, and 
your last episode, the eighth episode airs next week. Can you tease next week's episode and, and his downfall? Because thankfully there is a downfall. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I hope people, you know, are able to to stick with it throughout all, all eight episodes. Um, the final it, episode. It's wor- really, everybody should. I mean, you know, especially us Jewish folks here in the United States need to know the history of this with the rise of anti-Semitism taking place daily here. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, so the final episode is going to get into his, his downfall. Um, the, the sort of many series of events that, that transpire to finally force him both off the air and then later um, force the, the, the closing of Social Justice Magazine. Um, and then the sort of shenanigans that happen to, uh, you know, these efforts as I'm talking about the FBI to to prosecute him and whether they're able to actually do that. And then we, we sort of cast our net a little bit bigger um, after we've sort of told talked about Coughlin's downfall. Um, we talk about how he set this blueprint for this this pattern of demagoguery that uh, that has been replicated in various ways in various broadcasting mediums across uh, multiple generations leading up to the present. Um, and we sort of draw this line for you uh, where, where we, we really want you to see uh, the, the world that he created, right? The, 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 the mm-hmm. things that he, that he brought into existence here in a country where, you know, this kind of thing was never supposed to work. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what we're doing. And then we also talk about um, sort of the weird, his weird sort of final phase of life where he is just kind of preaching on his own for a couple of decades. Um, and, and we end with something I know you mentioned about, um, you know, in the first episode, I talked about how I visited his church, the Shrine of Little Flowers, yeah. and, spoke, and spoke to the pastor and, and how we were sort of figuring out um, to what degree the church, you know, talks about him and, and how it sort of makes sense of his legacy. So we circle back to that conversation in what I hope will be a very interesting and provocative way for, for listeners. Well, I mean, his impact, you know, the lasting impact and the, the correlation to everything that's happening today. One of our viewers even just said, you know, in your description, it's, you, you know, you were talking about Coughlin, but he said, sounds like the January 6th insurrection, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and certainly, as I said, you know, we were working on the show when that happened and it just it was too almost too much, you know, to sort of hold all those thoughts uh, in our heads at once. My, my producers and I, because it yeah, it seems so much like what what was going on then. It's interesting because I aired my second episode of Conversations with Alan that evening on January 6th. Oh, wow. I, I had scheduled it and it was the the show that I aired was me sharing my mother's story of survival during World War II. And it was just so surreal that th- those things were converging, you know, in my brain even, at, you know, and in the world at the same time, because it, it, it was something. Yeah. For listeners of your podcast and my show tonight, and from, you know, sort of all the research you've done, you know, on Father Coughlin and from all your reporting you've done over the years, what in your eyes can we and should we be doing as a society to combat anti-Semitism and this level of hate being spread? That's a good question. I think what we see time and time again at JTA and then also through doing this story is that anti-Semitism, like most other forms of hate, um, is a conspiracy theory that, that stems from ignorance and it stems from being fed a lot of misinformation and disinformation, right? Outright lies. Um, that's that's one of the things that happens. It's not like Coughlin just kind of wandered on and and started spreading anti-Semitism. Um, he built up this media platform first, right? And he won people's trusts. And that is something that we see, unfortunately, this pattern of history being repeated over and over again. And surveys show that, you know, today, um, Americans have an all-time low trust in the media and in sort of like, uh, journalistic institutions. Um, a, a lot of folks think we just kind of make everything up. 
or that we are, you know, spinning everything to uh, to suit our own our own ends. And so it's very hard to communicate reputable, um, you know, information in that kind of landscape. And then people don't stop consuming media; they just go to find, you know, alternative sources. Um, and so one thing I would say is like I think media literacy is so important. I think I think being able to have um, kind of a, a critical eye about uh, about the information you're being given and to sort of understand where it's coming from. Um, and also to be willing to have, as, as you're having uh, conversations, right. With, with friends and loved ones and, 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 and just, we don't want people to sort of disappear into their own little bubbles where they are being fed lies that won't go away because they're not talking to people they trust. Um, and so building up that trust is, is going to be really important, I think, for us to, to find ways to heal. That's as a media professional. That's 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 <laughs> that's my that's, biggest take. And away. you know, Andrew, you know, Alan, two Jewish guys having a conversation. <laughs> um, media literacy. I I I I love that you said that. I mean, you know, it, it, it's so true, and it you know we're we're fed so much information from from so many sources, channels, you know, uh, social media. People just need to to verify. For themselves make sure you know the facts yeah i would say uh yes I, I, I hopefully people can sort of understand the difference between truth and lies and, and understand what journalists do and that we're not we're not trying to manipulate you we are really trying to give you um the truth and and frame things in uh in a, a clear actionable way um and so you know hopefully we can we can regain some of that trust well, for you as as a journalist, I, I'm curious what has been the most difficult uh, part of the last sort of five years in the in the fake news. Um, uh, you know that that term being spread about what you do, which is you know just BS, but so many people do believe it. Yeah, I think the, the 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 saddest part for me, the most frustrating is not even necessarily for my work, but if I try to talk to someone about, you know, an, an, an investigation um, or sort of the results of it, uh, so, some great story that some other outlet has written. And if it's something that the other person doesn't want to hear, then they'll just they'll just sort of dismiss it and they'll say, oh, I don't I don't I don't believe it or well, they'll, they'll just print anything these days. Uh, and, you know, hearing that sort of thing is, is definitely hard. I'd say that's that's the biggest challenge. Uh, from, from my point of view, but I hope that every time I put out a story, I think like this doesn't need to reach everyone, but if it reaches like a, a small number of people who read it and appreciate it and, and believe it and are willing to like internalize it, then I will have done some small degree of good. So that's the thought I take with me. Well, that is the perfect way to end this, Andrew, because that is exactly how I feel. You know, I, I didn't create this platform for these conversations. I had created this at the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, because of my previous job in the daytime soap opera world. But now that I have this platform and I am Jewish and I come from two parents who were Holocaust survivors and without the people who risked their lives, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation, you know? And if we, you know, hopefully enlighten somebody or change somebody's mind or, or just made them more self-aware can't ask for more than that. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for hosting this. Well, thank you so much for being here. Radioactive episodes one through seven are available on all streaming platforms. You can go to Apple, Spotify, um, go to, go to the YouTube page here. There's links there as well. Andrew, I hope to uh, meet you one day in person. Thank you so much for doing this. Continued success. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alan. You're so welcome. Have a great evening. Okay, bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to Andrew Lapin for joining us today. Remember, as I leave you, we all have choices to make in life. Speak up, do the hard thing, and let's all fight hate for good. I truly believe conversations like this can change the world around us. Remember, listeners can access Radioactive on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and all major podcast listening platforms. Please feel free to share Conversations with Alan episodes with your friends and family. Until the next conversation, have a great evening.